Years ago, David and I had two dogs, one a uh, chocolate lab named Truffle, great name for chocolate lab, right? And the other a goofy golden retriever named Turkey. That's a long story how she got her name, but the name fit her personality, let's put it that way. Late one night, around about midnight it was, for some reason I decided to take our dogs for a long walk through the neighborhood. As we were moving back toward the house, almost to the house, I saw something in the shadows that stopped me in my tracks. Our neighbors who lived catty corner across the street had a vicious Rottweiler that they always kept in a kennel in their garage. No wonder he was vicious. But you would always hear him snarling and growling as, as people passed by. Apparently, our neighbors thought that since it was almost midnight, probably nobody would be out. And so they had let their Rottweiler out to run loose around the neighborhood. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed him running through the shadows around the corner of their house. And I knew that if he saw us, he would attack. So... Instinctively, I just tugged on my dog's leash as if to say, stop. And then I walked up to them and patted their butts as if to say, sit down. And then reflexively, without really thinking about it, I stepped in front of them and crouched down. My attitude being, Rottweiler, if you're going to attack my doggies, you're going to have to come through me first. Now, mind you, only after the fact, looking back on it, did it occur to me that this was all backwards. That my big old dogs should be protecting me instead of the other way around. But that's not how I saw it. Because you see, I, I'm not a father, but, but our dogs have always been like our children. And, and so in my eyes, I was like David, the shepherd boy, ready to protect my little lambs from a, a mountain lion that was about to attack them. So my attitude was... You want my dogs. You got to come through me first. And in that moment, I learned something important about being a father. There's nothing a father won't do for his little ones. You who are fathers know how true that is. You who are mothers know how true that is. Good fathers, good mothers Good parents, there's nothing they won't do to protect their little ones. When I was a kid, my family was out at a, a lake one day with our whole extended family. My cousin Steve got out a little bit too far into the deep water, and he went under. His dad, Uncle Kenny, didn't see it. I didn't see it. But Uncle Bill saw it happen. Now, you have to understand that little Steve was a snotty-nosed kid with a smart aleck mouth. He often popped off. In fact, he'd had some run-ins with Uncle Bill. Once he told Uncle Bill he was going to stuff him in a box. That didn't go over very well. But when Uncle Bill saw Steve go under the water, oh my goodness, I've never seen him with such a sense of urgency. He came charging off that beach, high-stepping through the water, water spraying everywhere. In like 3.7 seconds, he reached Steve and plucked him up out of the water and saved him from drowning. Because there's nothing a good father won't do, or in this case, nothing that a good uncle won't do. Thomas Vander Wooden and his wife, Mary Ellen, have seven children, the youngest of which Josie has Down's syndrome. One day, Dad and Josie were out in the yard when Josie wandered off and fell into a broken septic tank, eight feet deep, flooded with water. At first, Dad, of course, reached over the edge of the septic tank to try to fish Josie out, but, but Josie couldn't quite reach Dad, and so Dad jumped in to the septic tank, but still couldn't manage to keep Josie's head above the water. So he 
held his breath, dove under the water, came up under Josie, lifting him up on his shoulder so that now Josie's head was barely above the water line, but dad was still underwater. By the time the rescuers arrived, dad had drowned, but Josie survived. Because there's nothing a good father won't do for his little ones. And so it is with us and God. Right now we're in the midst of a sermon series on the meaning of the cross. You often hear people say that on the cross, God died for us. Of course, technically, it was Jesus, Son of God. But as Jesus says in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. As the Gospel of Matthew teaches us, Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. And so what Jesus does, God does, and vice versa, the mystery of the Trinity. And so people will often say that on the cross... Jesus had to die to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven. It is the most frequently mentioned reason for the cross. Jesus had to die to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven. But what does that really mean? That's the question we're going to tackle today. What does it mean to say that Jesus had to die for our sins so we could be forgiven? Let's start with prayer. God, why? Why on earth did you have to die for us? What does that even mean? We want to stretch and grow our understanding of the work that you did on Calvary today, so please guide us. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. A woman had just placed flowers on the grave of her dearly departed mother. As she was walking back through the cemetery toward her vehicle, she noticed a man who was kneeling at a nearby grave in extreme grief. The man there on his knees just kept saying over and over again, Why? Why did you have to die? Why did you have to die? The woman stops and says, sir, I hate to interrupt your private grief, but, but I've never seen somebody mourn quite so deeply. Tell me, for whom are you mourning? The man took a moment to gather himself and then said, for my wife's first husband. <laughs> took you a while, but you get it, right? Today, we are asking a similar question about Jesus, although with much more seriousness of purpose. Jesus, why did you have to die? In this current sermon series, we're looking at four great meanings of the cross. Why was the cross necessary? In week one, we saw that the cross conclusively demonstrated just how broken this world is and how broken we all are. We are all victims of the fall, We all need a Savior. In week two, we learned another critical life lesson from the cross. In week two, we saw that nobody is exempt from suffering in this world, no matter how good you are, not even Jesus himself. And so we need to adjust our expectations accordingly. As Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Now today in week three, we're going to look at what many believe is the foremost meaning of the cross, this idea that Jesus had to die to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven. As our scripture passage said, the one you just heard Ernest read, Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
1 Peter 2.24 makes essentially the same point. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. There you have it, this idea that on the cross, Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven, although you have probably, if you were raised in church, heard that said a thousand different times. I'll bet nobody has ever taken the time to explain to you what does that really mean when you scratch beneath the surface. Here at Life Journey Church, we call ourselves thoughtfully different followers of Jesus. That means we're not afraid to ask the hard questions. So let's put it bluntly today. Let's phrase the question bluntly. As, as J.D. Greer says in his, it tells about in his book, Searching for Christmas, he tells the story of a conversation he had with a skeptic who framed the question this way. The skeptic asked him, why would God need somebody to die in order to forgive our sin? If you sinned against me, the skeptic said, and I wanted to forgive you, I wouldn't make you, let's say, kill your dog before I forgave you. So why would God require some kind of sacrifice to forgive? That is a well-put question. And as I ponder it, two thoughts come to mind that I'd like to share. Why is it that Jesus had to die in order for us to be forgiven? Thought number one, only a victim has the moral authority to forgive those who victimize. If God had never been a victim, God would not have the moral authority to forgive. Let me explain what I mean. Consider an example. In the movie, Our Fathers, it, it tells the story of a group of men who live in the Boston area who, as children, were sexually abused by priests in the Catholic Church and then, as adults, decided that it was important, as difficult as it was, for them to tell their stories publicly, to confront the church, to demand justice. So these men band together for moral support to confront the church. They, at one scene in the movie, they were able to have a face-to-face -a, a -face audience with Cardinal Bernard Law, and they poured out their hearts. They told their stories about their grief, their suffering, what this had done to them, demanding justice. It was raw. It was emotional. It was angry. And so after this face-to-face -face meeting with Cardinal law, the group of them, these men gathered at a bar to decompress and to process their feelings. During a lull in the conversation, one of these men, a man named Tommy Blanchett, said to his friends, there's something I never told you guys. What? One of them says. Tommy says, Father Birmingham, I once went looking for him. He was back in 89. He was dying. I drove up to the hospital to see him. At this point in the movie, the scene shifts to a flashback to that hospital room. As Tommy walks into the room, the priest lying there, sort of foggy, unable to speak, weak. Tommy walks in and says, Father, Father, it's me, Tommy. Tommy Blanchett from Sudbury. I've come to visit you. You remember me, don't you, Father? The dying priest is lying there in bed with tubes running from his nose. You can see from the expression on the old man's face that he's shocked that Tommy is here. Tommy moves closer and sits down next to the bed, pauses, and then finally says, I hated you. What you did to me and my brothers and all those other boys at Sudbury, it was wrong. Tommy starts to cry. You shamed me, Father. It was wrong. How could you do that? But the old man can't speak. So Tommy takes a deep breath and continues. The real reason I've come I want you to forgive me. 
There's a look of pain and disbelief on the old priest's face. Tommy continues, I want you to forgive me for the hatred that I've felt for you all this time. I believe, Father, the promise that Jesus Christ made to us is true. So would it be all right, Father, if we prayed together? The old man can't respond, so Tommy reaches out and takes the priest's hand and then prays this prayer. God, in the name of Jesus, heal Father Birmingham. Forgive him his sins so that he too might have eternal life. Just then, the scene fades back to the bar as all of Tommy's friends are staring at him in disbelief. You did what? You said what? You prayed that you wanted him to be in heaven too? But here's the thing. If there's anybody who has the right to pray a prayer like that, it's someone who's been a victim. If I, someone who's not been sexually abused, were to say to someone who has been sexually abused, you should forgive your abuser. If I, someone who's not been sexually abused, were to say to someone who has sexually abused others, you are forgiven, that would be offensive. That would be stupid. That would be outrageous. What right do I have to say that? What moral standing do I have to say that? That would be what you would call cheap grace if I have never experienced the pain, the trauma of what it means to be a victim of sexual abuse. I have no moral standing to tell anybody who has that they should forgive or anybody who's done that, that they are forgiven. Only somebody who has experienced that in excruciating detail has the right to say that and only if and when they decide to do it. Because only a victim has the moral authority to forgive those who victimize. In essence, that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. If, let me put it this way, how could God ever have the moral standing to forgive those who victimize, those who hurt others through sin, and in one form or another, we all have, through our sins, hurt someone deeply and been hurt deeply by others. How could God have the moral authority to forgive a victimizer if God had never been a victim? Oh, it's, it's easy for you to say, sitting up there in the palaces of heaven, shrouded in light, surrounded by angels, omnipotent, almighty, never one moment in your existence ever knowing what it is to be afraid, never one moment in your existence ever knowing what it is to not be able to protect yourself. What right do you have to forgive anybody? It's a fair point. And so God took the form of Jesus, came to us in the form of Jesus, and entered fully into the human experience. He was betrayed by his own people. They turned him over to the Roman oppressors. He was falsely accused and falsely convicted. The Romans tortured him. 39 lashes with a Roman cat of nine tails, ripping his back open. Then they stripped him naked and gave him a mock purple robe and a mock crown of thorns. Hail the king of the Jews. Then they forced him to carry on his 
cut open back the weight of that cross through the streets of Jerusalem, parading him as a common criminal. Then they drove nails into his hands and feet and hung him up on the cross to die. Yes, Jesus knows what it is like to be a victim. So that when Jesus says to all of us who've ever hurt somebody. When Jesus says to somebody who's hurt us, you are forgiven. He speaks with the moral authority of somebody who knows firsthand in excruciating detail what it feels like to be a victim. I guess you might say he has earned the right to represent all who have been victimized down through the ages and to say to our victimizers, repent, receive grace so you too can be with us in heaven. In the law, there is a a concept that, concept that we call class action lawsuits. The basic idea of a class action lawsuit is that if a company, let's say, harms thousands of people, it makes no sense to, to force each individual who's been harmed to bring an individual lawsuit, thousands of different lawsuits on the same subject. Instead, in the law, somebody or some small group of people who have been harmed by that company are allowed to file a lawsuit on behalf of the entire class of all those who've been harmed by that company. For example, back in the 1970s, the Ford Motor Company made that compact car, the Pinto, that was a, a huge seller, but had a fatal design flaw, a reckless design flaw. They put the gas tank too far to the back of the vehicle so that when somebody ran into the back of a Pinto, often they would explode into a fireball hundreds were killed and thousands severely burned. So several who had been injured through these pinto catastrophes brought a class action lawsuit. The judge certified them as worthy to represent the class of the thousands of people who had been harmed by the pinto because these individuals representing them cla the class had themselves experienced that great harm and pain. And therefore the judge could have confidence that they would negotiate faithfully on behalf of all those who were harmed. They had the right to represent the other victims. That's essentially what Jesus did on the cross. That's why Jesus had to suffer on the cross. You might say on the cross he earned the right to represent everyone who's been victimized through the course of history and to set the terms upon which victimizers can be forgiven. So that now when Jesus looks me in the eye and tells me that I am forgiven for the worst thing I have ever done, it's not cheap grace. Jesus knows the pain that my sins have caused, and yet he offers grace anyway. Thank you, Jesus. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? To have the moral authority to forgive my sins. Thought number one. Only a victim has the moral authority to forgive those who victimize. But remember, there's, there's a second thought as well that I'd like to cover quickly. Why did Jesus have to die for us to be forgiven? Only a victim has the moral authority to forgive those who victimize. One. Second thought, and you've probably heard this one before. Justice demands a penalty for sin. If someone victimizes you, then gets off scot-free. That is the very definition of injustice. Wrongdoing demands consequences. 
in our deeply ingrained human sense of justice. There has to be an evening of the scales, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. A life for a life is a deeply, proportionality, it's a deeply ingrained human sense of justice. We see it playing out all the time in ways large and small. A husband and a wife had, had just had a furious argument. When all was said and done, they were both so upset that they decided they were going to give each other the silent treatment. Nobody was going to say anything to anybody. Neither of them wanted to be the first one to give in and to start to speak to each other again. So the silence continued through the evening until shortly before bedtime. The husband remembered that he had to be up at 5 a.m. the next morning to catch a plane for an important business trip. And he was wont to oversleep all the time. So he knew he needed the help of his wife to make sure he got up at 5 a.m. But he didn't want to be the first one to break the silence. So he came up with an idea. He, he wrote a note that he left where, she was, where he was sure she would see it, that said, please make sure I'm up at 5 a.m. The next morning, he awakens. The sun is streaming through the window. He looks at the clock. It's 9 a.m. He's furious. He's getting up to give her a piece of his mind when he happens to notice that she's left a note for him on the nightstand next to the bed that says, wake up, it's 5 a.m. And there you have it, our human sense of justice, proportionality, do unto others as they do unto you. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, lash for lash, silence for silence, I'll ignore you, you ignore me, we'll make it even that way. And though when something silly like that happens in our household, we can laugh it off in retrospect, the truth is that same scenario plays out many times in life in far more deadly ways. For example, in 1964, a Mississippi civil rights activist named Medgar Evers was murdered by a member of the White Citizens Council named Byron Beckwith. At the end of a long day, Evers pulled into his driveway at home, got out of his vehicle. Beckwith shot him from behind. The bullet pierced his back and his heart. He collapsed to the driveway, then got back up, stumbled another 30 feet, and fell in front of his, the door of his house. That's where his wife later found him. She called an ambulance. He was rushed to the hospital. At first, they wouldn't admit him to the hospital because he was black. Ultimately, they did, but it was too late. He was dead. In the aftermath, he was put on trial, Beckwith was, but an all-white jury refused to convict him. So, he went scot-free for the next 30 years. Byron Beckwith was able to live his life as if nothing had happened. But Evers' widow, like the widow in Jesus' parable in the Gospel of Luke, continued to insistently, persistently demand justice throughout the years. So finally, in 1994, Byron Beckwith was retried. This time, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, spent the rest of his life in prison. Finally, some measure of justice. But suppose at some point during that long 30-year wait, suppose somebody had come up to Ms. Evers and said to her, you know, you just need to let this go. You just need to forget and forgive. That would be outrageous. She would look them in the eye and say to them, how dare you? My husband's life mattered. Justice matters. And that's the dilemma that a good God faces. 
a good God who treasures both justice and mercy, how do you ever reconcile those competing values? That is, by the way, one of the questions that is explored in that famous Broadway musical Camelot. You're, you're probably f at least somewhat familiar with it. It's set in the, in the uh, medieval legendary court of King Arthur. And, and King Arthur is someone who regards himself as a good, a righteous, a faithful king who administers the law of the land faithfully against the strongest and the weakest equally no fear, no favor in the equal administration of justice. But then there comes a point in the story where Arthur's beloved wife, Guinevere, he discovers that she's having an affair with his dear friend, Lancelot. This was at a time in the, middle, in the Middle Ages when adultery was still a capital offense, and especially when a queen committed adultery, it was considered treason, a capital offense. Lancelot managed to escape. The queen did not, and so she was put on trial, and the king had to decide... Do I destroy my beloved wife, whom I still love dearly, in order to uphold equal administration of the law, or do I pardon her and prove that everything I've ever claimed to stand for is a fraud? That when the chips are down, I don't really care about justice. One of the antagonists of King Arthur in the musical sings these words, Arthur, what a magnificent dilemma. Let her die and your life is over. Let her live and your life's a fraud. Which will it be, Arthur? Do you kill the queen or kill the law? Essentially, that's the dilemma that God faced. Will it be mercy? Or will it be justice? But here's a thought. And by the way, I know it's hard to, for us to get into that example because we live in a world where adultery is no longer a crime. But imagine it just a little bit differently for the sake of the hypothetical. Imagine if Guinevere had murdered someone. And now King Arthur had to decide whether it would be life for life, or whether he would pardon her because she was his wife. What's a good king to do? What if, what if King Arthur said, I hereby pronounce that Guinevere is guilty of murder, and therefore I impose on her the lawfully compelled sentence of execution. But I also hereby decree that that lawful sentence, that lawful punishment shall be carried out against me. I substitute myself for her so that the victim's family are assured that that life mattered even as my beloved wife receives mercy. Essentially, as best we can understand, that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. Jesus found a way to forgive while fully respecting and honoring the gravity of the crime committed against all those who have suffered from sin have suffered as victims from sin. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. My point is not that God needed someone to die. My point is that we did. That our human sense of justice demanded that the scales somehow be evened. And so Jesus, who treasures both justice and mercy, stepped into that role. He substituted himself, taking upon him the just penalty for our sins so that now both justice and mercy could be harmonized. Let me close with this. True story told in John Muir's book, Travels in Alaska. 
It's a story about two Alaskan tribes back in the 1800s, the, the Sikin tribe and the, the, the Sitka tribe. They were perpetually at odds with each other in a state of warfare, sometimes low-grade warfare, guerrilla warfare. Sometimes it was open warfare out on the battlefields. Back and forth they went during one of these sustained periods of war. It was so dangerous that people from neither tribe could go to the salmon streams or to the berry fields to gather food to eat and food to store for the winter. It became apparent to the chief of the Sakin tribe that, that there was going to come a point soon as winter set in when people would be hungry and and eventually face starvation, both his people and the people of the Sitka tribe. And so at one point, the Sikin king or, or, or chief steps out of the ranks of his tribe out into the open between the armed camps and calls for a face-to-face -face meeting with the Sitka chief. When the Sitka chief comes out, the Sikin chief says to him, your people, my people can't go to the salmon streams or to the berry fields to gather food. There's going to be mass starvation. You know it and I know it. We've got to find a way to make peace. The, Sikhi, the, the Sitka chief responds, how convenient that you want to make peace now. Now that you have killed 10 more Sitka warriors than we have killed Sakin. The blood scale must be evened, the Sitka chief said. Give us 10 of your warriors, and we will make peace. The Sakin chief pondered this for a moment, then said, very well. You know who I am. You know that as chief, I have the value of at least 10 warriors, if not more. Take me and make peace. The Sitka chief nodded his approval. Remember, true story. The Sakin chief steps out into the clearing. The Sitka warriors take aim and fire. The Sakin chief falls dead. Peace is now made between the two tribes. The people are free to go to the salmon streams and the berry fields again to eat, to resume life. The blood count, so to speak, was even. In essence, that's what Jesus did on the cross. He found a way to forgive that fully respects and honors the pain and the suffering that victims of sin have experienced he found a way to harmonize our human sense of justice and mercy. He did that for us. Because there's nothing a good God won't do for us. Nothing a good father won't do.